Well, I have nine o'clock and we can start this meeting slowly allowing others to uh, log on, but I, this is the California Avocado Society, California Avocado Commission, University of California uh, Avocado Seminar. And this is sponsored by quite a number of people these days, Delray Avocado, Index Fresh, Mission Produce, Nutrien, Westpac Avocados, Westphalia av Fruit, Calavo, American Ag Credit, Avotopia Agri-Service, Brokaw Nursery, Farm Credit West, Yara, and Larry Walker Associates. So uh, we've got a big lineup here today. Um, I'm not sure exactly how far we're gonna go, but we've got Julia Marino, who's a plant physiologist, fruit tree physiologist. Uh, she's a specialist at UC Davis in the plant sciences department. We've got several growers who are gonna talk about their experiences uh, cooling with misting in their avocado orchards. And then finally, if we've got time, Lisa Fife from Australia is, uh, gave me a PowerPoint presentation. And if we have time, we'll go over that. If not, we'll move into August where we're gonna talk about uh, modification of temperatures and the environment in avocado orchards in August. So this is a two-parter and um, uh, this is something that we have not solved ultimately, but we're gonna get a handle on it. So uh, Julia is gonna give us a um, background on stress. She's a stress physiologist, you know, She's a specialist in stress and she's been working on pistachios and cherries and other fruit trees, not avocado, but she's got a, a sense of what avocados um, can put up with. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Julia. Um, this is Julia Marino, Dr. Julia Marino, and she's gonna to talk to us about uh, how stress can affect avocados. Julia, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, can you hear me? No, yes. yes. Perfect. And you can see my presentation, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, first, thank you so much, Ben, and thanks, everybody. Good morning. Uh, as uh, Ben said, I'm uh, an extension specialist in orchard system, which is a very wide, wide topic. Uh, I started work for the Department of Plant Science uh, one year and a half ago, so with the coronavirus, exactly. And um, my focus, I am from Sicily, so I specialize in Mediterranean crop, mainly pistachio and olive in the past, and now I'm expanding on other crop recently. Uh, focusing on stress physiology, mainly water in the past, and now also also I'm focusing on the interested and focusing on temperature. So today we're going to speak about physiology and management of the heat stress in orchard system. The presentation will be divided in four main uh, blocks. The first is an introduction to microclimate. Then we're going to talk about the energy balance and how. Uh, radiation can increase air and organ temperature. Uh, we will uh, focus on the uh, physiology of tree and how trees respond to heat stress and uh, some orchard management strategies to reduce the impact of uh, temperature stress on, uh, on, on trees. So microclimate is are the climatic conditions that are inside a uh, orchard, so the canopy of an orchard. But these um, can differ from the um, climatic condition outside, so the, from the macro mesoclimate. Of course, if you have outside uh, 100 degrees, you don't expect to have 40 inside the canopy. But you can have a modification that is associated to the characteristic of the canopy, how the canopy will filter radiation and uh, filter or stop the wind and create some uh, condition inside the canopy that can be different from the one outside. So since uh, microclimate is affected by, by the foliage characteristic, we can modify it with uh, any type of uh, cultural practice or, or horticultural management practices that would influence vigor. So we can think about selection of training system or pruning, irrigation, and uh, management of, of, of nutrition in the orchard. The macroclimatic condition will dictate the physiological response of the tree. Th this graph is for, for, for wine, but works the same exact way. And then the physiology will affect fruit quantity and quality. 
So men have been trying to modify microclimate from the origin of agriculture. This is an island in Sicily that uh, where uh, 360 days a year, there is a strong wind. And you can see how in the past they choose different uh, um, solution for different species. And also to have uh, like a citrus close to the house, they build this uh, stone wall that is called Arabic garden. While for the olive that is more resistant, they just trained as a bush in order to reduce the, the impact of wind on the, on the uh, production and being able to grow this, uh, this um, crop in this, uh, in this small island in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, there are several uh, climatic uh, factors and there are several uh, organs that receive or are impacted by this uh, climatic factor. And there is, uh, unfortunately, an uneven uh, availability of information. So light and water have been studied more than temperature and wind, and uh, all the information that we have focus mostly on fruit and leaves, while we have less information about branch and uh, roots. And I want to start with, with this slide because I really believe that uh, stress happen at a whole plant level. So you will see through this presentation that, that an holistic approach to the concept of how stress affect tree physiology is needed to understand also how to just then manage the orchard uh, consequently. Um, this uh, is the energy balance. Energy balance is like a way to calculate how uh, the sun uh, would, uh, how an, an object, in this case leaves, fruit and trunk, will be heated by absorbed radiation. Because when we speak about light, we always think about photosynthesis, but light has also a very important role in increasing or heating up the organs. Uh, we can calculate the uh, uh, heating or the storage, S is the storage component, so how much heat an organ will store with a simple equation. Well, the input, the energy input to increase temperature is mainly the air radiation. The radiation is not the same as the radiation from the sun because part of this light can be reflected. This is a leaf of uh, grape. And in general, let's say that 6% of radiation is reflected. All the rest of the, this, this net radiation that arrive, excluding the reflected one, will hit the organ or be um, released as heat or as latent heat. Latent heat means that this energy is used to evaporate the water, so get dissipated in this way. And this is what we call evaporative cooling. As a consequence, uh, the solar radiation will heat the different uh, soil, air, and different plant surface differently. So we can see here the daily trend of uh, radiation, and you can see that the temperature of the bark will increase accordingly to the radiation. But uh, so the blue is the solar radiation, and the red is the bark temperature, it goes up to 20 degrees Celsius. But the air temperature will not follow the same pattern, will be heated up sl 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 slowly. Or, um, and, and while in the afternoon, then you're going to have again in the afternoon, in the evening, the air temperature matching again at the bark temperature. Uh, what does it mean? This means that different uh, organ uh, will uh, being, uh, will the, the temperature of the organ will differ, will be different from the temperature of the air. And this difference will depend on several factors, water status of the organ, developmental stage, so ontogeny size, color, and so on. And unfortunately, most of the models that we use in agriculture are uh, based only on air temperature and don't consider that like the, the, there's gonna be that big difference between the air temperature and the temperature that the tree is feeling. Julia, could you speak mm -hmm. a little bit slower? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thanks Thank for you. telling me. <laughs> So here we're um, speaking about like a reflection and I, thought, I said before that how the um, different organ depending on the color and some property can reflect some light and in this way uh, reduce the increase of the temperature of the organ itself and we make an example with the leaves of uh, olive. You can see that uh, in this graph here in the bottom the, the green light is uh, the, reflect, the reflectance of the upper surface of the olive leaf that is darker. And uh, so the leaves reflect more or less 7% of the light, as we said before. The lower surface, 
which is white because of accumulation of a lot of hair. You can see here a microscopic image of the lower surface of the olive leaf will reflect up to 60 or 70% of the light, which is like more than 50% a lot. So this will um, um, uh, be reflected in very different temperature of the organs. And this is what trees do naturally, for example, this birch tree with this white trunk and what we simulate when we do like, uh, we paint the trunk of the, of the trees. And um, we increasing, we are strongly increasing reflectance of light. And uh, this uh, difference in temperature can be observed in this graph. So the blue color, is the stem, the temperature of a stem not painted, while the, the red color is the, a stem that has been painted with white. And you can see the lower temperature during the midday, the central part of the day, up to five, six degrees Celsius of difference, with the stem that is painted having a temperature very similar to the one of the air, the black line, while the stem that is not painted with showing clearly higher temperature through all the, all the season here, like several months. Now, another important factor when we want to understand how much uh, the organ in the tree will be uh, heated up by radiation is the capability of this organ to dissipate energy through evaporation. Uh, this is what we call latent heat flux. So it's a flux of heat that we don't feel it because the energy is used to evaporate water instead of being stored in the organ. And this depends on the capability of the organ itself to, to let this water uh, evaporate. So for example, stomatal frequency or intensity. So a leaf that have, has a lot of uh, stomata will be able to evaporate a lot of water. So this LE component or latent heat flux component will be bigger. So in this equation where the net radiation is the input and this latent heat flux is the output, if the latent heat flux is bigger, so the storage is gonna be smaller. In a fruit where the stomata are less and the latent heat flux is smaller because the fruit cannot evaporate so much water as a leaf, then you're gonna have a bigger accumulation of heat with respect to a leaf. And here we can see it like in number. You can see the temperature of a leaf that is shaded with a dark point and the temperature of a leaf that is under the sun. And you can see that the difference is not so big. So big. In general, there are five degrees Celsius of difference and, size, and five degrees Celsius of difference as a maximum between leaf and air temperature. Uh, on the right, this is a nice experiment. You can see the dark block are uh, trees that have been um, stressed with water logging. So these trees are closing stomata, but not because they don't have water in the soil. While the white are plants that haven't been water, water logged. So they're transpiring normally. And you can see in the red is the stomatal conductance. So how much water they are transpiring. The red are, uh, this red block, the water logged trees have a lower stomatal conductance. And the, the difference between the temperature of the leaf this delta T is the difference between the temperature of the leaf and the temperature of the air is positive. This means the stomata are closed and the leaf's temperature is five degrees, six degrees higher than the temperature of the air. When the stomata are open and they are transpiring more, the leaves are cooler than the air in these white blocks. And this delta T, so the difference is negative. As we said before, for fruits is different because they cannot transpire so much water as the leaves. So the difference between temperature of the fruits and temperature of the air is gonna be bigger. More or less, they say 15 degrees Celsius. So if you have 25 degrees in the air, you're gonna have up to 40 degrees. This is the bark of a cherry tree in, in winter. So when it's, there are no leaves, it's fully exposed. Uh, to radiation, while um, this is a fruit of apple, and you can see same same relationship. So if you have 35 degrees in the air, then you go up here and you have more or less 50, a little bit less than 50 degrees Celsius of the fruit. So you have to consider always that your fruit are gonna be 15 degrees Celsius, more or less 
uh, uh, more hot than the air. And the, this can change again with the, the fruit color, so the varieties, the, the, the stage of development and the size of the fruit and the water status and the other parameters. So what are the take home message from this first uh, part of the presentation? We uh, know that the fruit and the uh, surface temperature or the organ surface temperature in general is very difficult to predict just from air temperature. The there's gonna be a difference between air and organ temperature and this will vary a lot with the type of organ, the phenological stage of development, uh, the cultivar that can affect the color and the other parameter, tree physiology and so on. Radiation is the main driver of this difference. And uh, for site specific condition, we can uh, create models that will tell us when we expect the fruit or the trunk or the leaves to be at a specific temperature. But of course, this model has to consider the site specific condition. So for example, how the uh, orchard is structured, how many, what, what is the, the plant, plant density and, uh, and uh, so on. Yeah, maybe slow down a little bit. But in summary, right now, you've said that air temperature can be uh, much lower than bark temperature. 15 degrees is kind of normal for a higher temperature on bark that's been exposed. The leaf, because of its stomata, can cool itself. And the fruit, because it has fewer stomata, can't cool. So it's more likely that it's going to be hotter than the leaf. And it might even approach the temperature of the bark. Is that true? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Thank you. And with the bark, I've been observing even higher temperature. The one I showed that can be very, since it's dark and uh, and uh, can really reach uh, significantly higher temperature with respect to the air. So it's something that is never considered. What you know, when we calculate the growing degree days or chill accumulation, we we always focus on air temperature. These factors are not always considered. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So speaking about um, plant physiological response to heat stress, you will get familiar to this uh, type of curves. So this is bell shaped curves, because in general, any physiological process uh, respond to temperature in this way. There is like a minimum, a maximum where then the physiological process will stop with some critical temperature. And then uh, we're gonna have a, a, an optimal, optimal temperature when that specific physiological process will happen at the highest rate. So for example, in general, tropical species have higher performance at, a speci at, at the optimal temperature, but then we'll have a lower range of, of temperature, so a faster decrease of the, of the physiological process when the temperature switch from that optimal. Now, not all the time that, for example, grow is reduced because the temperature increases, we speak about heat stress. We speak about heat stress when the temperature goes beyond a specific threshold for a specific period of time that causes some irreversible damage to plant growth and development. So several combination of time and exposure, so like time and, and, and threshold can cause this type of damage. So for example, cell death or cell injuries can happen in few seconds at a very high temperature or at a moderately high temperature for a longer time. And this curve uh, show very nicely when in a pine, 50% uh, of the leaf will be dropped due to heat stress. And this can happen in few seconds at 56 degrees. You can see here the temperature, 56 degrees. You just need a few seconds, not even one minute. But if you have 46 degrees, then you will need one hour of time exposure to that temperature. But the consequence that will be the, 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 the result will be the same. So 50% of leaf dropped in the ground due to the stress. The damage or the impact of this heat stress happen at several levels. So it starts at cellular level and then goes up at organ and at tree level. And um, we're not gonna focus a lot on the cellular level, but just shortly what happened, the main process or the main things that happen is T3 
tissue dehydration because of the heat and the request of water, production of toxic compound that are called reactive oxygen species that are toxic for the cells, alteration <clears throat> of membrane. Membrane are very important for a lot of function and they get directly alterated and alteration of protein and enzymes. These are the physiological at cellular level, the main process that are affected by, by heat. When we go at a, at a higher level, we know, we know that photosynthesis is influenced or affected by temperature. And again, you can see this type of typical curve, this bell-shaped curve. You have an optimal temperature for, uh, for photosynthesis that uh, for avocado is around like 28, 30 degrees. After that, the photosynthesis will sharply decrease and will arrive around at zero when we reach 40 degrees Celsius. Now this reduction is due to some direct impact that uh, heat has on chloroplast and, and the protein associated to the process of photosynthesis, as we said before, this like, like smaller scale impact. But there is also an indirect effect because heat stress affects leaf water potential, stomatal conductance, and these are in yellow because I will speak, it's a little bit more complex and I will go for with one slide for these two, two process. But then you have also leaf area reduction and leaf senescence. So leaves will become older, faster, and reduce their performance. Speaking about water relationship, I said before, is a little bit of a complicated topic because water stress, uh, so drought stress and heat stress are highly interconnected. In nature, these two processes happen together. There is not heat stress without water stress. Uh, in orchard system where we irrigate, we can have heat stress relatively without water stress. So with water in the soil, how plant would respond to something like this? they can either try to keep stomatal open because they have water in the soil and keeping the stomatal open will allow them to cool down. So this will simplify or help the evaporative cooling. But in this case, there will be a lot of water lost due to transpiration. And this can create a deficit of water or decrease the water potential inside the leaves. Or they can close stomata. In this case, what is going to happen is that if they close stomata, the drop in water potential will be, will be less. So they will be able to protect themselves, the leaves, from water lost. But leaves will heat up as a consequence of stopping the evaporative cooling. So plants in nature um, produce some compound that are called osmolite. This compound can concentrate inside the cell and gives to the cells the capability to uh, keep the water stronger. So to be more um, resistant in um, protecting themselves from water loss. And this, you can see here, the black uh, dot are plants that have been exposed to heat and they produce all this compound that protect the cells from uh, drop of, uh, from losing water, excessive water. Uh, under excessive uh, heat stress, leaf uh, drying and uh, shedding or like leaf drop can uh, occur to uh, protect the plant from uh, failure of uh, the hydraulic system due, due to this uh, continuous high request of water from the environment. Another physiological process that is um, impacted by, by um, uh, heat is uh, uh, carbohydrate storage or carbohydrate level in the trees. Why? We say that the photosynthesis is influenced, but we didn't say that uh, respiration under heat increases. And it can increase uh, uh, strongly. You can see here, each 10 degrees Celsius, you can have up to 200% more respiration. So what happens if you reduce the production of carbohydrate, but you strongly increase the use of carbohydrate? You're going to create a, a starvation. This starvation can trigger senescence, leaf drop, and response to plant to a condition of sublethal sub condition. So all this process like, will intuitively bring to reduction of growth 
because if we have lower photosynthesis, if we have water loss or water stress, we know that all these bring reduction of growth. This is, this is like the normal uh, consequence of lower production of carbohydrates. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about the fact that the temperature can also alter phenology. What does it mean? That is, uh, we know, for example, that fruit growth development needs a specific amount of thermal time. For example, 500 growing degree days. Uh, this 500 growing degree days can happen in one month, but if you have a lot of heat, they can happen in 15 days. So if the plant have to finish fruit grow in 15 days with few carbohydrates and few resources and water stress may happen to be not able to match that growing rate needed. So you will end up with smaller fruits or less growth, less vegetative growth, less production of wood and so on. All these will bring as a consequence yield reduction, but also reduction of the quality of the production. If you have smaller fruit, the production quality is reduced, not only the yield in itself. Uh, speaking about reduction of quality, there is another uh, factor that has to be considered, is that um, the, um, uh, apart from the physiological uh, impact of heat stress on plants, so on process, uh, there are also some morphological uh, effects. So heat can affect morphologically different organs of the, of the tree, from the branches scratching or scorching or sunburns, leaves and essence, we say this, inhibition of shoot and growth and uh, rolling of the leaves. One of the most important uh, morphological symptom of uh, heat stress is the discorrelation of the fruit and the damage on fruit surface, which have been studying uh, more than the other, than the other uh, morphological symptoms because of its uh, economical uh, impact. Um, sunburn has been a big problem for apple. This is why I've been widely studied, studied for several decades. Uh, it can decrease production between 10 and 50%. This implies a lot of money lost for, for the growers. Um, we know that this is gonna become a bigger problem because of the increase in temperature that we're expecting in the future. But uh, the, the, the important thing of these things of the increasing temperature is that the, more than an average increase of the temperature, we are gonna have always more days with, with the average temperature higher than the average. So instead of having every day zero, two degrees more, we're gonna have some days with three, four degrees more, and then some days with normal temperature. And then again, a lot of days with temperature going higher than the normal average. So models have been developed to predict how this will affect the production. Uh, this is why this topic is getting more importance in the last year. And they're starting to study also impact other than just the sunburn of the fruit. But we will focus on sunburn of the fruit and apple because it's where most of the information has been developed. Um, it is very important first to classify the type of uh, morphological symptom that you have because not all of them are the same and not all of them are caused by the same uh, factors. And this nice example in, 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 in Apple is like they, they recognize in reality three, but here I'm showing two because they are the one related just to temperature. Some burn necrosis, this can happen at 52 degrees Celsius, so 126 Fahrenheit, which if you think that the fruit can be 15 degrees Celsius more than the air, it's not so difficult to, to, to reach this type of temperature. However, this just need temperature. And is associated with some, some, some symptoms like uh, physiological symptoms. While uh, when we go to the sun brown, sun brown browning, in this case, it can be reached with lower temperature, just 40, 46 degrees Celsius, which is 115 Fahrenheit. But it doesn't happen if there is not sunlight. So in this case, ultraviolet radiation has a strong impact or some contribute in this type of damage. So, first step into like a correct management of, of um, heat stress in an orchard is understanding what is happening and what are the physiological processes that happen behind this type of uh, symptoms because they can be very different. 
uh, take home message from this uh, second part of the physiological response. So we know that high temperature can affect multiple physiological processes. And this can happen at different scale from subcellular to the entire tree. Among these, the most important are photosynthesis inhibition, water stress in presence of water, and carbon depletion and starvation. There are also several morphological damage that can be of economical importance. And uh, this uh, damage will depend on the threshold and duration or length of the stress. And then the ultra V radiation is needed for some specific damage. So they don't happen just with temperature, needs light to, to, to show. Julia, at, th at this point, th there is a difference between water stress and heat stress. And what do you need to do to maintain transpiration in the face of heat stress? And number three, what impact do antitranspirants have on heat stress? So it's a three-part question. Yeah, so, so for sure, man, like trying to keep the plants are well hydrated as possible, like really like being sure that when you know that this uh, arriving at heat waves, you want to be sure that your soil is moist and there is not a lack of water in the soil. That is the most intuitive um, uh, response to this question. Um, having a healthy tree, because like, you know, like if you have had stress before, this can affect the um, uh, conductive system in the trees. And so like embolism happen. So if you had water stress before, this can affect the capability of the, the conductive system to bring quickly the water to the, to the leaves in a very fast way. And um, I, there is also like one uh, part that is associated to the amount of uh, leaves in the trees, like the more leaves you have, the higher are going to be the transpirational flux, the less you have, the lower is going to be or the less is going to be. Regarding the antitranspirant, so another thing that I wanted to add to this question that is uh, interesting because we're going to speak about uh, evaporative cooling, you know, over, over eddy irrigation, and we always talk about this as a potential tool to decrease temperature of the leaves. But nobody talk about the fact that leaves can absorb water through their surface as well. Of course, it depends on the species and different species can have different capability of uh, uptaking water through the leaves. But uh, for sure, like uh, having a wet leaves in this situation can help because uh, even if it hasn't been very much studied that you can have absorption or uptake of water through the leaf surface and through the stomata. Not in this Would case. Would an antitranspirant increase heat stress or decrease heat stress? This is, this is a, I wanted to avoid, you know, it's complicated because it depends on what is the most uh, critical factor for that species. So if the most critical factor is having a high, the, the, the most critical factor is the high temperature of the leaves, then that will increase the heat stress. But if the most critical factor is the low water potential, then in this case, it could be useful, right? So there are some species that are able to stand a very low, olive, olive stem water potential can go as low as like minus 70, 70 bars. That is not gonna be a problem for the olive, but some other species will suffer of a lower water pot potential lower than minus 1.5. So I think it really, this really depends on how the species will deal with either temperature or uh, water stress, because one implies like it's an equilibrium between the two things. Did that reply to your question? Somehow? Yeah, so it's complicated. Here's another question. Um, can you distinguish between a high heat wave and high temperature? Um, I'm not really sure what a uh, heat wave versus high temperature. So uh, is there a difference between a, a, a pro, prolonged period of heat versus a, a spike in high heat? You know, what's, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, we saw it is like, it's a combination. The, the, there is not one threshold. The same, uh, the same uh, consequence, like the same effect on tree can happen with a very short moment and very, very high temperature or more prolonged heat. 
but a lower temperature. So we saw it, I, I showed the slide before. So really each physiological process is affected differently, but the same result can be obtained or a, a negative result can be obtained with different combination of these two factors. So in, in this case, I think really characterizing the response of physiological process to temperature is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Mary Lou Arpea points out that uh, avocado leaves on the top surface don't really absorb very much. They, they really don't. only have stomata on the undersurface and mm -hmm. so they're not very good at absorbing things. In absorbing water yeah. because of the, because of the, 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 the lack of stomata on the upper surface. On the top. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I go ahead. So management, we uh, plans develop um, a method or tools to deal with high stress and temperature stress, high temperature and, and uh, low water. And uh, in the next slide, I will show what plant did or how plant naturally deal with them and how we use similar tool or similar method or we copy the plants to try to deal with this type of conditions. So when there is a heat event, the plant can try to avoid it. So, so we're trying to avoid that its organ uh, temperature increase or can try to tolerate it. Um, about tolerance, I will describe here three main um, type of response. One can be uh, osmoregulation. We spoke a little bit about this. So the plant develop or produce some uh, compound that will concentrate inside the cell decrease the potential of the cell and allow this, uh, the leaves or the plants to, to, to attract more water. And uh, they can develop phenolic and antioxidant. This will prote protect the, 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 the leaves or the organs from uh, eye radiation and from this uh, toxic compound, the ROS or reactive oxygen species that we described uh, before. And uh, they can also um, produce what they call heat shock proteins. So are some proteins that are able to protect other protein from denaturation or also to kind of fix this protein that have been altered. Species and plants do this naturally. And of course, they depend on the uh, evolutionary path of this species, how it develops. Uh, this kind of uh, response to environment. So some species can do it, some species cannot. Uh, what can we do? We can uh, stimulate this like by uh, genetic, so select varieties or cultivars or do some biotechnological changes to, in, to select this, to induce this type of, of response. Or we can induce them with acclimatation. So trees that have been um, um, uh, under heat stress before develop this kind of response and so they end up being more resistant. Or there are also some studies that show that the product can be applied to uh, simulate this type of uh, um, process. And uh, results are very variable, but they've been trying and they've been applying any kind of product from inorganic salt, osmoprotectant, hormones, and uh, so on. Now, I will focus more on the avoidance. That is the part that is more uh, associated to horticultural practices. And uh, plants do this uh, in nature as well. We described and we show like increasing reflectance of, uh, of light with different solution, hairs and color, or um, escaping the heat. So selecting cultivar that produce before the heat, uh, the period of heat, this in nature happen some plant just drop all the leaf before summer, or it, the, the, the chilling period of, of deciduous species is a, a way for trees to avoid the, the cold, in this case, the cold temperature, but similar type of uh, strategy. Evaporative cooling, we described this, and shading, some plants that just decided they don't want to deal with uh, temperature and they prefer to get adapted to lower uh, light environment, like in the understory of a forest. We do the same in the orchard, more or less, when we do evaporative cooling, we apply kaolin or we can use some, some net to shade the trees. Now, these results are for uh, sunburn. 
So they focus just on fruit. That's not going to be uh, most probably the same type of result if you focus, for example, on the impact on leaf drop or other type of process. But focusing on sunburn, you can see that the most efficient way to reduce sunburn is the shade net. Why? Because you reduce most of the temperature and you reduce the direct effect of the radiation that we saw in case of sunburn can be very um, can impact a lot the, 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 or increase the, the, the amount of uh, damage. In Apple, the shade net created some issues with color because color is a quality factor in, uh, in, uh, in Apple production. But you can see like the control, 15% of the sunburn with evaporative cooling, it was reduced by 10%. With the kaolin, it was reduced other 5%. So, and then like with the shading basically almost zero sunburn this is an, an, um, a trial of a shading net in avocado you can see that they were able here this the white box is the waste fruit of fruit that were damaged and you can see that there is a 30 percent of uh, damage in the control or open field while when with the blue white and red net the, this this damage was reduced and it was only around 10 percent now they checked also some quality parameter and the net seemed not to have negative effect on the quality, but this, this was just two years experiment. Um, and this is nice, this is on Apple and they show that yes, netting is the most efficient. You can see here the income like was like $10,000 more with the netting with respect to the control, followed by this spraying of kaolin or lipid based product, 47, 48 and the evaporative cooling, 43, but then the cost or the annual cost of netting is uh, high. So at the end, when you go into net income, uh, the netting was a similar result with respect to the kaolin or lipid spraying compound application. Now, um, this slide, this is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about photosynthesis because when we talk about trying to reduce temperature, we always reduce also photosynthesis. So this is like also like a, a question about like a method um, to, to reduce heat. And uh, um, I want to stress that photosynthesis response to light is uh, non-linear. It gets saturated at one point. And it gets saturated at a photo, photo, photosynthetic flux density, a photo, photon flux density that is around 20, 25% of the one of full sunlight. We don't really full sunlight in the leaves to perform maximum photosynthesis. At the same time, the extra light we know, and we already showed that can decrease strongly photosynthesis. And uh, when we compare uh, light in, uh, and this is an or uh, trees or mango, I think, mango trees, you can see that the light, yes, is you have more light under sunlight with respect to the shaded, but, uh, more or less, when one is above the saturation point, also the other is above the saturation point. And when they go below the saturation point, it's because it's late in the day. So the difference that there is, but both are almost all the day above the saturation point. So why we try to intercept more light in the orchard system is because when one, one thing is one leaf, when you talk about the entire trees or all the leaves within a canopy, you can see that the leaves never intercept of the light, but they intercept light either, for example, here you can see this leaf, since this is the light outside and this is the light on the leaf. One leaf will intercept a lot of light in the afternoon and no light in the morning. And uh, as opposite, another will intercept a lot of light in the morning and not in the afternoon. So when we move toward the entire tree with respect to the single leaf, we have an increase of photosynthesis over the entire trees of over the entire day with respect to the increasing the amount of light intercepted. However, this, based on this concept or on this graph, the training system that we know today have been developed that try to uh, create a thin canopy that expose the most amount of leaves as possible. But uh, these type of guidelines don't take into consideration the, the, op the negative effect that the temperature have on this curve on photosynthesis. So this is the same response curve, but considering temperature. And you can see how at 40 degrees, this response curve is half of the one that you can have at 30 degrees. 
So what is the conclusion about this? The conclusion is like, it's really like maximizing like interception, the best choice in all, in all the industry, in all the type of system. And this is like the um, uh, comparison of the photosynthesis of uh, shaded, shaded trees versus trees under sunlight. And you can see that in a cloudy day, yes, the sunlight trees are making more photosynthesis, but in a clear day, it's the shaded trees that is making pho more photosynthesis. And this result overall at the end in a higher number of fruit per trees in the shaded trees with respect to the one under sunlight. So conclusion to think about this is like in some fruit growing region where a very high level can reduce productivity, maybe we have to develop different model that can minimize the uh, negative effect of light and maintaining productivity. And I will be very fast because I think I'm running out of time here, but uh, this is how we always thought about torture system to maximize light. This is a super high density olive. Our main aim is to maximize light interception to increase productivity. So this is why we suggested the Northeast oriented orchard. You can see the east, Northeast oriented orchard is the red intercept more light than the East West oriented, correct. So we want to have this because we want to intercept more light because we want more production. But what about the things that the east-west intercept more light in, in winter and less in summer, shade more in summer? And in winter is when the radiation is less intense as opposite to summer when the radiation is more intense. So this is like just like a to think for us to think a little bit that probably like a different solution may have to be considered to try to uh, create an equilibrium between maximizing photosynthesis, but also reducing the impact, the impact that that temperature have on has on photosynthesis. And um, so to conclude this last part of the presentation is like, how can we protect ourselves from high temperature? We have the filters like, some product that can screen filters or block light. The evaporative cooling, we saw how it works and this impact, photoselective net, netting, and surely have good uh, and uh, adapted horticultural practices that uh, focus on keeping the trees as healthy as possible, as uh, um, in a good water status uh, with a with a, with a canopy that shade the important part of the of the trees and so on. So management practices that are um, helping the, 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 the trees to perform better. What do we need in terms of knowledge to develop? Uh, we need to know what are the physiological uh, processes that are affected by heat stress at whole level that can vary from species to species. We need to know threshold, temperature threshold for each stress for each organ. And based on this, develop some predictive models that can help to uh, predict when the temperature will be uh, detrimental for, for the orchard. Based on this, we want to develop uh, management practices, for example, evaporative cooling. We, went, we want to know when to turn it on, how long. This will really depend on these three previous blocks of information. And maybe also combining methods in, in Apple, there are combining evaporative cooling with uh, some product application successfully. And then that's in the longer term, developing new orchard system and using breeding and uh, cultivar selection. And uh, I think I'm yeah, more or less in time, <laughs> more or less. And thank you so much for the time. Thank you, question. Julie. Here is a question, um, avocado root, root rot reduces the, the size of the root system, but the, the canopy doesn't change. Or you have transplanted a tree and you don't have a very large root system, but you still have a large canopy. What is the best way to irrigate a tree that has a smaller root system relative to a, a large canopy? Is there a rule of thumb that you can follow? Well, like I am a, a supporter of plant-based irrigation always so for me the best way instead of going with some even more when you have this kind of situation the best way that like, you can do for um, being sure that your trees is well irrigated is asking to the trees instead of relying on biometeorological index so for me i always suggest whenever it's possible because it's of course uh, more time consuming you know 
uh, either if you want to do pressure bomb or if you want to use any kind of sensor, interpretation can be tricky. But for me, uh, we should move into that direction, like uh, particular in situation when, when irrigation can be so important. Yeah. Well, one of the growers uh, on the panel today is going to talk about using dendrometers and leaf temperature sensors. Yeah. Have, you, have you had experience with dendrometers and leaf sensors? Um, I, w I did. I work uh, with dendrometers and I work with the sensor that uh, um, are basically some small clamps that are attached to the leaves and uh, they give approximate estimation of, of turgor potential or thickness that, that depend on the point of view. Yes, I mean, like I found these tools very useful. Like some people sometimes complain that they are not super, they can be influenced by environment. So the problem with these tools is like they, they have a lot of potential, but for me, they are still too expensive for, 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 for growers. So the still the technology has, has a cost and when you have to want to replicate it on several trees, uh, can be this can be an issue and uh, the interpretation of the data should be automatized more but uh, I think that this can be they can be both very useful tool when when uh, when threshold and method to automatize it like I mean of course you don't leave the growers alone to trying to interpret like dendrometer data because it's like there is interposition of temperature it has to be simplified because but uh, yeah, for me, they, uh, for precise irrigation, it's extremely important to move toward automatic, automatic plant-based monitoring. Yeah. And then a final question. How long in advance of a forecast heat wave should one begin irrigating? Does it work if, if you're in the middle of the heat wave or should you wait, should, should you start a day before the heat wave or two days or three days? Is there a rule of thumb you can follow? Yeah, I will. I will definitely. Uh, I mean, like, uh, I think trees should be should be well irrigated before the coming of the heat wave. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, how many days? Like, I think they should. If you know that you are in an area where 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 the earlier the better, of course, because like you you you, you, you the trees have the time to it up to to um equilibrate to the change of irrigation. But it depends. I don't know if you are not irrigating completely. As I said, like it should be, uh, it's, I really believe it's better to avoid stress before because stress can affect the conductive system. So like keeping always the tree not highly stressed, even if it's like two weeks before. So, okay, here's another question that just came yeah. in. Um, increasing the, the, um, the biome, the, the microbial activity in the soil, uh, increasing the health of the root system, is that going to affect a uh, tree's response to um, heat? Yeah, definitely. Anything that can improve the capability of the tree to bring up water and to uptake water and to like be more efficient and quick in uptaking water will 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 have positive impact. Absolutely. And there there are there are some studies also about improving soil. Um, um, water uptake of uh, water in the soil like that and treatment of amenda there are a lot of studies but yes overall whatever improve the capability of the plant to uh, keep moisture is going to help uh, to face the heat wave okay well thank you julia um, thank you so much we're going to hear some more practical um, uh, discussion of of, of um, misting now I'll and start our, sharing. yes and uh, John Rowley is a re representative of Nelson Irrigation. He is a, um, Nelson Irrigation is located in Washington. And Julia mentioned the, the work that's been done on apples. And um, so Nelson Irrigation has done a lot of work on apples. Um, and, he's, and John's gonna talk about the, uh, the, their work on apples and potential impact it has on avocados. So John, are you out there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, very interesting uh, what I was able to catch of the earlier information uh, that's been shared today. I'm, I'm gonna speak more from, uh, as you say, the application level of this on a commercial basis. Um, 
and uh, I want to I want to share a screen. This should allow me to share a screen, right? So uh, there are approximately three hundred thousand acres of apples in production in in the Northwest. If you can include parts of Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, uh, as so it's a large industry. Um, they typically produce tonnages in the range of, um, oh, a, a, an average apple crop on the new high density plantings, probably in the range of about 60,000 pounds of apples per acre. And, and uh, on the, you know, the low end 40 and on the high end 80. Um, and uh, the, the apples, of course, are cooled uh, for a number of reasons. Not every acre of apple is cooled, but um, there's some sort of heat protection applied to, I'm gonna guess 70% of all apples produced in, in the Northwest. Um, uh, they're at, at, at great expense, um, 15 to 20,000 an acre. Some apples are covered with shade cloth one grower in particular, Oval Fruit Company, has maybe the largest acreages covered up to three or 4,000 acres and others lesser. Um, uh, but the most common way to try and mitigate damage from heat to an apple crop is, is the use of water. And so I'll focus mostly on that methodology of cooling. There, there, there are a lot of different chemicals being applied. Um, to the, to the fruit as well. And a lot of di different things tried, a lot of things have come and gone over the years. And I'm not an expert on those, uh, those things. So I won't, I won't address those issues uh, today. Um, but I have been involved in, in the cooling of apples and other crops worldwide as a product manager at Nelson for, for 29 years now. And I've seen a lot of trends come and go and and we'll probably see a lot more as, as time goes on. Um, the, see if I can get this to advance, there we go. So we see cooling of crops for a number of reasons and, and this has been discussed earlier and I think it's kind of helpful to look at some of these other things that we see happening in other crops that might, some of the things they do might help us in avocados. Um, uh, in, in walnuts, uh, sometimes uh, the walnut growers in Northern California will, will in, in a real heat wave, they'll try to run their under tree sprinklers uh, more frequently or on hot days um, to prevent sunburn uh, in, in the tops of the trees and of the fruit, the, the walnut itself. In apples, um, the, the, we're preventing sunburn uh, as, as a measure, but Another real important part of cooling apples has to do with storage. Apples are put in controlled atmosphere storage where the oxygen is removed from a sealed room. And, and apples can be stored 12 months in this kind of storage uh, and sometimes longer if the quality of the apple that goes into the storage is, is good. And it doesn't have any, what they call internal damage. And internal damage is prevented by crop cooling. And that's one of the bigger reasons that, I mean, the, the higher color and grades is important, but uh, being able to put the, the crop in storage is, is another motivator for, for the widespread use of uh, water for evaporative cooling of apples. Um, we see, uh, particularly on the Eastern side of Oregon and Washington where blueberries are grown, we, we see in the, in the hotter climates where we see temperatures in you know, the 95 degree range quite commonly in July and August, we see a lot, we see cooling of blueberries as well. And uh, this is done to keep the fruit from going soft. Um, some, some have, and it was talked about today earlier, uh, uh, there are many that uh, cool because they believe that uh, they extend the 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 photosynthesis uh, of the of the plant, and thus the production of of the fruit uh, sugars and everything you need to produce that fruit. And so 
Um, that's that's a motivation in some cases for cooling. Um, in blueberries, we get these really hot winds on the eastern side of Oregon and Washington, and sometimes you'll see them cooling those plants after harvest. Uh, and I'm told they're doing that because of what was discussed earlier about the leaves being able to take moisture in. It's a quick way to hydrate a plant that's quite moisture sensitive. Um, in cherry, and specifically sweet cherry, it's very common in the southern part of California from uh, if you're talking like Kern and Fresno County um, in particular uh, to see to see sweet cherry growers uh, apply cooling in that crop after harvest. And this is done to prevent doubles and to help with um, better fruit set in the in the coming year, or at least that's what we're told is the reason they're doing it. Um, and there's been cooling of deciduous crops as a strategy to delay bloom over the years. This is strategy usually waterlogs the soils. And so it's not very widely used. It creates too many other problems. And of course, now um, we at Nelson Irrigation have assisted at least five growers in, in Southern California, particularly most of them in the Fallbrook area of Southern California, um, avocado growers, to begin um, cooling systems in avocados. And uh, several of these are installed or in the process of being installed now. And it, it appears to me the primary motivation to cool an avocado crop is to prevent fruit drop uh, during a really hot period of time. But uh, depending on water availability, uh, there may be some other motivations that, that come out of this as is discussed earlier. Uh, if if we can continue the metabolical um, activity of the plant, then maybe, maybe we have other reasons to, to cool avocados. I think the economics of that will really, really play out as your water costs uh, in Southern California as high as anywhere in the world. Um, so what are, we, what are we really looking at or what's a real important thing to think about as, as we think about crop cooling? Um, one of them is, is, is what is the effect of different, um, uh, what are the, the physical changes? If you, state, if you change the physical state of water from a liquid to a vapor, how much, how much energy do we consume? And that, that figure is for every gallon of water that evaporates, 9,000 BTUs of heat per gallon can be consumed. And that's, that's a key figure because if you look at other figures such as um, how much heat is consumed if, if water just changes temperature uh, from, a, from a cooler temperature to a warmer temperature, it's much, much less. It's like in the 90s BTUs per gallon of heat that's released. So this, the energy that's required to change from, from that um, liquid to a vapor is, is what we're after. That's what's helping us in evaporative cooling. And you've all experienced that. If you've been swimming in a colder climate and, and you, you come out of the swimming pool and there might be a light breeze blowing and let's say it's below 80 degrees, you're gonna feel, um, you're gonna feel that on your skin, that evaporative cooling, because you feel that chill. And that's the exact thing we're trying to do to leaves, stems and fruit on, on any kind of a crop. Uh, if we're cooling, uh, we're, we're trying to pull the heat right out of the plant. And the best way to do that, the most efficient use of our, of our resource, of our water, is to evaporate water on those surfaces. Some cooling strategies seek to evap the, wa the water before it reaches the tree. And there are reasons for that. Um, the reason that that's employed in some apple cooling systems is, is to prevent water from hitting the ground because they want to deficit irrigate the crop while they cool. Um, but, um, but, but in your crop, in the case of avocados, I can't see any motivation for that. And so I, I see the greatest motivation in avocados is to conserve the water resource, which is very expensive. 
and and so and so the we, we would we would seek to use the most efficient use of that water which is to evaporate it on the surfaces of the plant the fruit and the leaves so i i've already emphasized that this is a picture of an apple cooling system uh, you can see these sprinklers are extended up above the apples uh, in this case they're about four feet above the tops of the canopy of the apple trees this is a high density apple orchard and uh, and a system like this in apples will be run um, for approximately six to, to to seven to eight hours a day and it will be ran um, uh up to 45 days a year so they'll they'll apply a lot of water for evaporative cooling on an apple crop it's not a it's not a one or two day event it's it's in essence every day that they think that the, the apple can be damaged they turn the system on some growers are much more sophisticated than others at this some growers just they have a they have a time clock set up and, and, a, and an automation system and at a certain time in the morning, it fires on and the cooling starts. Other growers use um, uh, they use temperature sensors. Uh, they're um, I'm trying to think of the right word to describe them. They are um, they're infrared type guns that they sh they shoot uh, a, like a an infrared signal to to the fruit itself, and it measures the internal temperature of the fruit. And there was a lot said earlier today about radiant uh, effects and how, and and this this plays a big role in cooling because as as the if if you have a cloud cover, uh, the need to cool is reduced uh, versus if you've got direct sun, and so they'll measure they'll measure the effect of the radiant heat. Some days they may turn the water on. The more sophisticated growers may turn the water on at in apples at eighty five degrees. And other days they may wait until 92 or three or four degrees. And that'll all depend on the, what they're measuring on the internal part of the apple as it heats up. Apples are somewhat transparent. And so I liken them unto your automobile. You park your automobile out and outside on a cloudy day and then you climb in it. It's not near so hot as it would be if, if the same temperature on a sunny day. And we get the same effect in, in the internal part of the apple. So. So that's why the more sophisticated growers have these um, infrared uh, thermometers and they're, they're, they're running around the orchard in the morning and they're taking apple temperatures. And every day they have two or three guys on four wheelers running around these large, you know, 500 to 1000 acre apple projects and they're, and they're taking temperatures to figure out when they're gonna turn, turn on their, their cooling system. Um, so, um, what do we see as most effective for cooling systems? Well, the, the obvious is if, if we're trying to maximize the use of the water and, and be as efficient with the use of that water as we possibly can, we want to distribute the, that water evenly. We don't want, and you, you look at a picture like this where you see these trees are only three feet apart. We don't want a sprinkler system out there that leaves a tree that's not covered or that's not covered as evenly as another tree um, because we're trying to get water on that tree and, and then we're trying to turn that system off for a period of time and, and let that water evaporate, pull the heat out of the fruit and out of the leaves and then, and then turn the water back on. Um, a, a grower in California in the Stockton area back about 15 years ago got pretty sophisticated with this and he he had internal thermal couplers and apples and he had the he had the infrared guns out there and he was running his system and then he'd stand out there and every minute he would measure the temperature of the internal part of the apple and after doing that he arrived uh, if if he was in Stockton California and and the temperature was between 95 and 100 he found that um, he would run his system for eight to 10 minutes, it was about 10 minutes on, and then he would leave it off for 15 minutes. And he found that in that temperature, in that condition, to be the most efficient use of his water. Um, so he had that cycle going pretty rapid. Um, for, 
for feasibility, we see a lot of apple growers do things like 15 on, 15 off, or even some 15 on and 30 minutes off. So that's something that uh, as, as avocado growers start to work with this, and if they have the ability to measure some of these uh, leaf surface temperatures or fruit temperatures, um, I think they'll, they'll in, in the conditions that you guys deal in, I think maybe you'll be able to arrive at, at the right kind of cycle. But my, my suggestion from the get-go would be get some automatic valves on your system, automate your system, cycle the water on and off. You can run it continually and get the same effect but you're going to use twice as much water. So um, that's why we, we want to start, turn it on and off. Um, so I've kind of already talked about a lot of this. Uh, our rotator sprinklers are widely used for cooling. In fact, uh, it's, I'm going to say 95% of the sprinklers used for cooling in the Northwest are one of, one of our rotator versions. Um, there's several reasons for that. One reason is because they don't vibrate. They, they have a reactionary drive. They, they look a lot like your, um, your, your rotors that are used to irrigate lawns, if you, if you know what I'm describing there, or maybe you've seen our rotators before. They turn slowly. They, turn, they make a rotation somewhere in the range of uh, six seconds to about 20 seconds usually for cooling. And, um, and, and while they turn, there's no vibration. There's not an impulse arm that causes vibration. Impulse type sprinklers have been tried a lot over the years for cooling. And pretty much from what I can tell, they're almost completely abandoned. And again, the vibration of the riser is the primary issue, issue for that, the reason for that. Um, we also at Nelson Irrigation, we provide a new wireless automation technology. It costs roughly, um, it's, not, it's not cheap. It costs growers roughly about seven to hundred dollars a valve to put it out, but it, it can be controlled with your phone. If you can, you, you get an internet connection to your controller and you can control this with your phone remotely wherever you're at and you do not have to place wires in the field. To, to control valves that might be remotely located throughout the field. So it's a completely wireless system other than a short, a short um, wire that runs from our twig, which is our radio receiver, to the valves. And this allows you to get those frequent cycles on and off. That, that equipment looks something like this. Um, you, have, you have the twigs that are out in the field by the valves. You have the controller that's usually located where we can get the internet into it. And then we have a 900 megahertz signal that's carrying commands from, from the Twig MC controller and the hubs, which is the, the radio gateway or the primary radio, out to the twigs, which are located at the valves. And, um, and that 900 megahertz radio signal, that's the same signal, that's, that's the same radio wave that's used on your garage door openers but it's, it's a radio wave that is only line of sight, and, but it has up to two miles of, of, uh, of distance that we can send these signals. So even large, large Apple products can, or projects can, they can adopt this equipment and they can use it to set up their rapid cycling. And, and this equipment, our, our wireless twig network or, or our twig wireless equipment is widely used there's, there's over 150 large Apple tracks in, in the Northwest that are using this equipment to cycle their water on and off in apples. And, and it's very reliable, it's great equipment, but it, is, it, it does come at a cost. As I mentioned earlier, about seven to $800 a valve is about the cost of this system. But it's very, it's a uh, it's good, good system, good solution. There's other solutions to automate as well. You, you can run wires to your valve and, Lots of other companies manufacture automation systems that can be used for rapid cycle cooling. John, also, yeah. John, before you go any further, there are three really good questions that have come up. Sure. One, is there a difference in effect of droplet size on cooling? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, there absolutely is. Um, 
the, there, I've had a lot of questions over the last two years from avocado growers about why don't I put your big cannons out? We make a sprinkler that's we call the big gun. People call them water cannons, and these sprinklers throw 100 feet in distance, or even some of them throw 300 feet if you get to the really large ones. And and they the reason that we don't look at those at all and as a practical solution to cooling is two reasons. One, they apply way too much water instantaneously. So, uh, and, and number two, they have very large droplets. And these large droplets, they're, they're gonna hit the leaves, they're gonna hit the, the, uh, the avocados, and then they're just gonna wash right to the ground. And so we're not gonna, we're not gonna maximize the use of that most critical resource, which is the water and the most expensive resource involved in this whole, this whole venture of cooling is the water. And so, so that's the reason we don't want large droplets. We want smaller sprinklers with smaller droplets, yet we don't want droplets to be too small as well, because if they're too small and we get large amounts of misting, then we don't maximize the use of our water resource as well because we evaporate too much of the resource before it hits the leaf and, and, and uh, crop surfaces, in this case, the avocados. So we want, we want a small droplet that's big enough that it doesn't evaporate in time by the time it hits, by the, time it hits the crop. So this goes, this goes back to Julia's comment that it's not the air temperature, it's the surface, it's the leaf temperature that's important. You're trying to reduce the temperature. Exactly. So, so droplet size. So number two question is, do people run their um, surface irrigation, their, their normal irrigation at the same time as they're misting? The answer is yes. Apple irrigation systems are very, um, they're intense. Um, in an, in an apple orchard, we have an under tree sprinkler system that's used to maintain cover crops, which I, I, I don't need to go into all the reasons why that's of value to the growers, but it is. And, and it's widely practiced. Um, and yet also widely practiced is a drip system, uh, inline pressure compensating emitters, uh, often two lines, but sometimes one line of, of drip is also used in apple orchards. And in addition to that, you have a third irrigation system. You have an overhead uh, system for cooling. And so um, the answer is yes, all three of those systems will be used for different reasons during the cooling season in, in many, many instances. In some instances, the, the growers will try to rely only on the overhead system for, for both cooling and irrigation. This is not an efficient use of water because uh, if you're irrigating during the day, a tremendous amount of evaporation takes place as you wet all those leaf and fruit surfaces and the water evaporates on those surfaces. And, and you almost, if you're using an overhead system, at least in apples in the Northwest, and you, want, and you need to irrigate as well, um, you've got to run that system at night and for long periods of time yeah. because of the evaporative losses. So. So the, the answer is yes, they do have alternate systems. And yes, if you're going through a spell of, you know, three weeks of cooling, um, we're evaporating so much of that water before it hits the ground, um, we are irrigating as well during that time period. What's the next question? And the third question is, uh, can these systems be used for frost control for warming an orchard in the wintertime? So the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, the um, overhead frost protection is, is effective so long as, in, it is back to those energy equations. I'll go back to that earlier slide. Um, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, overhead frost protection is effective so long as we apply enough water to maintain the, the temperature of ice crystals that you're forming over the top of your fruit, your leaves, your tree at 32 degrees. And, and that's a thermodynamic equation of getting enough gallons of water on 
given the wind speed and your temperature. And so typically what, what I would suggest for a cooling system in, uh, in an overhead cooling system, both in apples and or avocados, is a system that applies water at about nine hundredths of an inch per hour, or for your metric guys, 2.4 millimeters per hour. An overhead frost system needs, in most freeze conditions, needs to apply water at at least 14 hundredths of an inch per hour up to 20 hundredths of an inch per hour, so more water. You need more water to keep that ice at 32 degrees because you're relying on that 1200 BTUs per gallon to keep the ice crystals that you form over the top of your crop at 32 degrees to prevent damage. Uh, I farm myself, I've experienced this, I've put too little water on and uh, your ice turns milky and your crop dies. <laughs> and so if you don't put enough water on, it's, it is dynamite dangerous. Um, yeah, uh, so anyways, so, you know, uh, the, the application rates we're talking about for cooling, they might work down to like 30 degrees, maybe 29. It's any colder and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay. Thank you. Not all of them? Yep. Good questions. Okay, we were, we were on the topic of rapid cycling with various types of automation equipment. And most of the avocados that, that I'm aware of are grown on uh, ir, uh, undulating terrain, a lot of steep slopes. And if you're going to cycle a system on and off a lot, uh, it's not going to work. You know, if you're going to run a 10 minute cycle and you're on a sloped site, you've got a five minute fill time uh, for the, all of those pipes to fill up. And so one thing that we see widely used in cooling on the sloped sites are check valves. And so we sell a lot of these as a manufacturer. We make these, we make them with, with, a, with a regulator in them, which takes higher pressures and regulates them to lower. And we make them with just a check valve in them, which, which will hold the water in your pipes. So you put one of these check valves underneath every single sprinkler and all of the, the water delivery system from, from, you know, from your pump to your sprinkler is held full of water when you shut the system off. And you turn the system on, you're instantly up to pressure. So it, it's an added expense, but in, I, would, I would judge this as a very necessary expense if, if water resource is tight and, and the cost of water is high, especially if you're looking at cooling more than just during your heat waves this would be a very critical component, um, a check valve at every sprinkler. Um, there are lots of application rates used for cooling apples. Um, they often depend on the variety of the crop and, and uh, the site. Um, th there, are, there are some that are as low as 25 gallons a minute per acre and others as high as 40. And, and that often depends on the sensitivity of the, of the fruit to internal damage. Um, it's, I don't think that, that there's really good research or experience in avocados yet to come out and say, we need to do this. We, need, we know it needs to be this amount. Um, but I believe it's closer to the 40 than the 25 if your experience if the temperature that you're experiencing is between 110 and 115 degrees, I think it's going to take closer to 40 than 25 to get the job done on a day like that. Um, that water is going to evaporate really rapidly at those temperatures. <coughs> and your cycle times might need to be shorter than those that I've suggested earlier as well. You may also find that it may be necessarily just if it's 115 degrees to just run 40 gallons a minute per acre continually. I don't know the answers to those questions. I know this much. I was involved in some research conducted by WSU, which was conducted a long time ago in 1994. We helped them with uh, the hardware and the site for the research. They had thermal couplers in, in hundreds of apples on these replicated test plots. And what they determined is that on a, on a 90, 
uh, let me see if I can remember this. It was on a, on a hundred degree day in the state of Washington to hold an apple at 90 degrees with the water that they were using, which would have been about 55 degree water. Um, might have been a little warmer, might have been about 65, probably about 65 degree water. Uh, they needed 40 gallons a minute continuous to hold the fruit at 90 degrees. Um, uh, you may not need to hold your fruit at 90 degrees to keep it on the tree. So maybe you don't need that much water, or maybe you can cycle it on and off. And those things, you know, the only thing that can, dis can discern or determine what that's going to be is some research and trial and error. And so my recommendation is to start out in that 35 to 40 gallon a minute per acre range and to cycle it on and off and see if we can get get through these heat waves with about that much water, which would be overall about 20 gallons a minute per acre, or maybe as low as 15. Um, and that'll stretch the water resource, I think, as far as we can possibly and still get meet the objective. So I mentioned, you know, 70% of 300,000 acres of apples are cooled. And so if, if you ever pop on Google Earth and you look at the apple growing regions in the state of Washington, you go to regions like Royal City, Mattawa, Basin City, um, you're going to see on Google Earth numerous two acre, two to five acre reservoirs, water reservoirs. And these are all placed out there primarily for cooling because none of, none of their water delivery systems have enough water to apply, you know, 20 to 40 gallons a minute to, per acre to every acre. None, none of the water delivery systems have that much water instantaneous. And so water storage is, is widely used. Uh, the larger avocado growers probably really need to seriously look at this, um, this option of water storage. Once you have water storage in place, you're gonna find you're gonna become a much better irrigator because then you can place on-demand systems in. So our irrigation systems in the state of Washington, I, I call them on-demand systems because they're all, they're, they're, they, they, their primary characteristic is, is they're pumping out of a reservoir like you see here with usually a, a turbine pump that's set on a variable speed drive with, with, with what we call a sleep option. And so it, it's almost like, your, your faucet at your home, uh, the, the, the main lines to these irrigation systems are always pressurized. And the variable speed drive pumps, they ramp up and they ramp down and they adjust to water needs. And those are the kind of systems that are really the most, the, the, they're the, they're, they're the, they, they accommodate cooling the best. And then once you have that in place, now you can fully automate all your irrigation all your, your drip, your micro sprinklers under tree, whatever else you're doing, and become much more, more precise at what you're doing because you have on-demand water. So we have a full line of sprinklers. Um, in, in cooling, we, we always suggest the sprinklers with the smaller droplets in general and the faster rotation speeds. So in general, we see our, our models R5, R10, and R10T that are used in cooling. In avocados, and I'm sorry, this is kind of small. Um, in avocados, um, I'll go back to this picture. You see the, the sprinkler there that's gray colored in the middle. It's, it's called an R10T. That's the sprinkler that we most recommend in avocados. Uh, and there's several reasons. We like the droplet size. Um, we like the fact that we can put um, a reasonable number per acre out about typically a typical application in avocados is going to look like what you see here. So if you look at the, the symbols on this drawing here, this, this page that I'm showing, we call this an overlap. The dotted green circles are representations of trees. Those trees are, are spaced 10 feet down the row and 20 feet apart uh, between rows. Your sprinklers are the are kind of the asterisk looking figures, if you can see those. And you'll notice a large circle drawn around the, the, the sprinklers shows the wetted radius of the sprinkler. So we talked about watering uniformly earlier. And this is, this is like sprinkler 101. If you want high uniformity, 
you 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 space those sprinklers throw so they throw head to head in at least one direction. So you'll notice that the um, you'll notice that the circle, which represents the area or the radius or coverage of the sprinkler, throws just far enough to touch the next sprinkler going down the row in this example. And, and then they touch, they overlap over the other row. So this kind of a layout is how you get uniform coverage. It's not simply a matter of making sure every area is covered by a wetted radius, but rather making sure the sprinklers overlap each other to get good, good coverage and uniformity in the field. And so this is a very typical uh, avocado setup that we would maybe recommend you look at with this R10T rotator. And this is, uh, and you'll notice uh, if you can read, I guess the, I'm sorry, the print's not very clear, but this is 36 gallons a minute per acre. The average application rate is nine hundredths of an inch per hour on this particular layout. Hard water conditions is something you want to watch out for. Um, we've seen in apples that sources of water that have high levels of your salts, your, your sodium, potassium, and magnesium in particular, and also calcium. Calcium not a, necessarily considered a salt, but those other salts, those salts will bind with calcium carbonate. And you, you'll see this picture of these leaves and you see the white coating on the edges and then you see the burning. And so the salts, they bind into that calcium carbonate precipitate that's left on the leaf. And then, and then the salts start burning the leaves. And so there's just, the, the bottom line is often, is there some water treatments that help with this? Acids help, there's others. I'm not an expert on that topic. I won't delve into the, the options. But the bottom line is, is if your water is hard or it's high in these salts or both, uh, just move forward with caution because you may create another problem that you don't want, which might be defoliation. We see that from time to time in apples and apple growers, they just have to treat their water or, or change their water sources. These are just some pictures of how sprinklers are mounted. Uh, this is overhead in apples. This is a, a blueberry installation where the sprinklers are, they're installed on a T-post and there's, there's an apparatus, there's fittings. This, this particular setup is what we're suggesting in avocados. Um, you, you, the photo shows the top part of this. It's a three quarter inch pipe. And that three quarter inch pipe is, is strapped to something, uh, most likely a long post of some type. And, uh, and then there's, there's a, a pipe, it's a 10 millimeter flexible hose that brings the water from the ground up to the height of the sprinkler. And that 10 millimeter, which is approximately three eighths an inside diameter hose um, would go all the way from the, where the sprinkler is down to the ground. Uh, this is a similar setup with smaller sprinklers in, in blueberries. Um, Big gun. Yeah, um, we've got some more speakers to come along. Um, oh, okay, I can wrap up. You bet. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, th I think that really kind of wraps up what I had to cover. So, I, uh, if I can, I was just yeah. going to show a few other ways that people put them up to cool. So that I think that's good. We're going to have a grower panel at the end of this, and you know you're going to get a lot more questions. Okay. So well, thank I you, John. Um, you bet. Our next speaker is Ryan Halby. He's the uh, manager of ACW Farm down in Deleuze uh, near Fallbrook. And he's been uh, working with a big gun uh, uh, sprinkler and, and he's been using automated valves and um, we're gonna hear from his experience. So Ryan, um, can you share your screen with us? Yes, hello Ben, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, so so here's Farm HTWs in Fallbrook overhead cooling system. And first I'd like to introduce us to why we started this is because we've experienced a heat wave in both 2016, 2018, and of course last year in 2020, with pretty much extensive damage to fruit and fruit loss and tree damage. 
and we do expect, you know, heat wave events in the future. We do know that overcooling, overhead cooling works with our experience in the nursery, not only under shade cloth, but also in our grow yards with overhead cooling. So we'll get to the maps. So our farm size is 500 acres and the lines that you see, the colored lines on this map is basically the five installs of strings or runs of overhead that we have installed and have completed or are very near completion. So three strings were installed in the top elevation of the farm with the idea that, that the cool air sinks, the other two lines down below for other purposes on young plantings. So going to the next map, basically each circle represents an emitter and its radius. The purple dots are represent of the control valves or the actuation valves, which are in this case, eight inch on long strings. Uh, we design each strung, string or run is built on the road with the riser post placed to the edge of the road. Uh, why we did this, uh, it's impractical for us to install risers in the middle of the grove on steep slopes. It's easy to maintain with our equipment and less plumbing and easier to build. We also knew that small sprinklers mounted in inside the grove would lead to clogging. And with our size, you know, we, we just wouldn't be able to control that. So the larger sprinklers do have little to no clogging. So on this map, it does show that each string is between 3,000 to 4,500 foot in run. So each containing between 15 to 28 risers and or sprinklers. And each of these symbols that is shown in between the two circles in the green and the red represent uh, valves and sensors. Now these sensors are placed within the wetted surface and what will we still need to do is place sensors further outside the wetted surface to show the effectiveness of the cooling. So we'll move on to the design part. So this shows a single riser placement and its radius and it's pretty much in relation to the other, the other risers themselves. So starting off with the type of impact sprinklers or full, full sprinklers, this is an example of a fairly inexpensive two inch, 200 or 100 foot radius, 200 foot diameter impact sprinkler. And a typical post construction buried three to four foot in the ground, of course, with the riser post and its connection and well each each overhead sprinkler has its has its own valve so we can control and regulate the whole string down to a, a, a very similar PSI rating. And uh, this is a layout of one of our pump stations which we have three uh, so we could run a total of three strings at a time throughout the farm during, during a heat wave event. So our water source for these pump stations comes from our reservoir. The output flow rate in which we design these overhead strings is about 1500 gallons a minute, but that varies as we gain elevation and different head pressures. So that factors into the design of our overhead runs. So a uh, typical one of our, our 100 horsepower boosters 
which helps facilitate the pump station, get the water up to those strings in our, in our highest elevations, and also a switching valve that actuates our overhead. And the switching valve is drawing water from our normal under tree irrigation and switching it to the overhead. So a typical pipe installation for these long runs, these 3,000 to 4,000 foot runs, starts off with, you know, of course, a, a new hydraulic valve, sections of eight inch pipe reduced down in telescoping down to four and even two inch as you come to the, the ends or corners of the install. So this is a typical, or this is you know, one sprinkler in operation, kind of given an idea of the water drop size. Uh, in this case, it's large water drops. And what you see here is, is a, a nice stream of water, which further increases the trajectory. And that helps on getting a completer radius. So this represents an example of posts alongside the edge of the road versus us being able to put placement of posts and possibly very small sprinklers in the middle of the grove and the challenge that would have and an execution and be able to control. So here's an example of what one string looks like in operation now this i believe this is like six or seven sprinklers and and this typical run would have a total of 15 doing a coverage of uh 3, foot of run so above that and below that we we also have others installed which we would cycle on and off and the run cycle times we are not too sure of yet we would like to achieve just you know maybe a few minutes on and whatever that would take us on to cycle throughout the farm for hopefully some effective cooling so here we have some video and what the video does show is both above the sprinkler itself looking down over the top of the canopy And the second video here was when we were doing our testing, which demonstrates kind of what's going on below the canopy and, and the amount of water that is put out, which is quite a bit. So on to operation and automation. What we're looking here is basically our 
irrigation and overhead irrigation within our Motorola system, which controls all our irrigation automatically. So everything is programmed in. So we do not have to turn on pumps or turn off pumps. And if you look into the, the, the top of part of the screen, uh, the prior photo of the pump station is representative of what this is. Of course, the three pumps, the booster to the right, and below is the overhead irrigation integrated into that with the same three pumps and the booster and of course with the the new overhead cooling valves now to the right of that demonstrates some of the sensors that we have installed both in the wetted area for for some of the video that you just saw and also some other sensors that were outside of the wetted area in fact at the pump station itself, approximately 2,500 feet away. So a typical ear net control point, uh, what controls the valves, uh, the, the solenoids that, that turn the valves on and off. And uh, another ear net connection, which demonstrates that they are self-contained by both batteries and solar. A uh, typical switching valve, which does show, which connects to our normal main irrigation lines. And in this case, they are eight inch connections. And again, with the overhead telescoping down in within the pipe header. So some use on sensors. So we went in with four different types of sensors and all within the wetted surface. So some of those, uh, some of those sensors are, of course, temperature, humidity, and we tried to leave it within the canopy of the tree, uh, a regular aerometer. Uh, this aerometer is, does not have the dial on it. We have connected it to our Motorola system. Here is a leaf, uh, leaf wetness sensor, of course, with the leaf on there on top of it, inhibiting its performance. The use of a dendrometer, which measures the swelling or the shrinkage of the trunk due to the amount of water uptake it has or stress. We are still trying to figure out what all that data provides. So on to some results that we've seen because we've done most of this install over this winter and spring. We do not have too much testing done. So we went in with fresh testing results last week. And of course it was last Friday was the when we last ran it. So that's the most recent information we have. So this was a temperature profile when we ran the system last Friday from 1.30 to, to two o'clock. And from this temperature, you see it's, there was not much change, but it was a cool, humid day. But what isn't recognized here is it's, it's very stable. And that's just a highlight of the target area. So you can see the wetted area where the sensor was when we ran versus the outside temperature at pump station three on another heat, or a heat sensor that was approximately 2,500 feet away. So here is the same humidity sensor that was with that heat and it shows a good increase in humidity. So that's the highlighted runtime that we've, we've kind of concentrated on. So 
So here's the wetted area within the one sensor that was within the overhead. And of course, a comparison of a second weather station, if you will, outside at pump station three, you know, a half a mile away. This is the leaf wetness sensor. And it does show exactly what happened. We had an overhead irrigation and there was an increase of about 300% in leaf wetness. So going back to last year, post Labor Day heat wave, when we got really serious about doing installs, and doing some testing on what type of sprinkler and system that was suitable for our hillsides. We started doing some, some testing and you could see, of course, both heat and humidity increased during that time frame. from, well, the temperature decrease and the increase in humidity from our run time from two to three o'clock in the afternoon and these days, that day it was about 90, 95 degrees uh, for a high. So what we experienced was plus or minus a 10 degree drop in temperature with a 20% humid increase in humidity, which is significant when the humidity gets down to about 20%. So an idea of costs, uh, here's all the typicals, parts, automation, sprinklers. The pipe is variable, especially this year with PVC costs. On the posts themselves, we were able to use, to use, drop, use well drop pipe, which we have plenty on hand. So we don't really know what post design people will look at in consideration. And of course, it takes a lot of work to put these things in and a bit of time. Uh, the cost per acre is still to be determined as we have to learn more effectiveness as to the cooling area for each one of these strings. So I think we are at the end here, yes. Hey, thank you, Ryan. Um, what we're going to do now is quickly go through some smaller orchards. Uh, Nick Coetzee's orchard near Ojai and Ken King's near uh, Santa Paula. And you may see a difference in um, performance and how these um, other systems can work. So we'll go quickly to the Nick Coetzee's. Okay, Nick Coetzee is uh, near Lake Casitas. He's got nine acres. He's got basically one source of water, which comes from Lake Casitas, and he, but he's got um, a 24,000 gallon tank. Um, he, he only gets 50 gallons per minute per, at 90 PSI. So he's got to control these pressures that are coming out of the tanks and um, that's coming directly from Lake Casitas. He's calculated the cost at about $1,000 for parts and installations per acre. Um, and this is some real data that he typically gets about 14,000 pounds to the, to the acre. And um, this is what drove him to install the, his misting system, his uh, cooling system. In 2018, he had 18,000 pounds per acre. And then after the heat wave of 2018, he was down to um, about 4,000 pounds per acre. Um, and then he installed the system and it went back up to what he'd had before. And you can see that he's, he's continuing to, to do well. These are the systems he uses. He's got uh, Rainbird impact sprinklers that um, put out 3.3 uh, gallons per minute and they only have a, a throw of 38 feet or 76 feet in diameter. Um, and he uses these in areas where he doesn't need a, or want a full circle. 
In the other areas, he uses these full circle Rainbird LF2400, and they have an output of 5.2 gallons per minute at 25 PSI. And they have a much longer distance throw of 44 feet. Um, and he's got, a, again, it's nine acres. It's laid out in um, a system where he's got his irrigation lines, and then he's got valves that go to his um, risers that have the uh, misters on them. And so he figured out that he needs about six emitters per acre. The, and these are the, the LF 2400s. And he basically has them touching and they, they um, represent only about 80% of the wetted area. He's got five blocks and um, that's because of the low volume of uh, water that he's got. And, and in order to maintain the pressure um, to each of the areas he needs to uh, irrigate them separately. So this shows the throw, okay? So it's quite a bit higher than, than the trees. And there's an overlap with this sprinkler right here. And he's got risers that are galvanized pipe. The oh, 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 launch polling, what was Um, he's got risers that um, come off the, the um, uh, buried lines, and he manually turn, has to turn on his overheads, separating the irrigation lines from the cooling lines. And he's got temperature sensors. Um, and this shows you the effect of you know, running these it, it pulsed irrigation. They're 30 minutes on, um, and then he has to run through the five blocks. And these were his air temperatures in 2006. Um, actually, this is 2019 when it was run. And he gets almost a 10, 10 degree drop in, in temperature. And so his system successfully controls temperatures. It's significantly reduced fruit drop. He's got no significant adverse effects, meaning the question came up, does he get um, salt burn? Um, uh, in, in his case, he's only running them during these heat waves. It's not a continuous system like you saw in the apples. Um, so this is, you know, we get these heat waves that come through and cause damage. So he's not putting a lot on, a lot of water on. So. As a result, he's not getting a lot of salt damage. Okay, with that, we'll look at Ken King's system. Okay, Ken King's system in, near Santa Paula is a smaller acreage. Um, he only has 1.9 acres. He planted this area uh, back in 2015, and then he just recently planted this forward area. Uh, of only one, one, one and a half acres or so. He's got 90 gallons per minute. Um, he's got a tree spacing of 12 by 15. He's got lamb and gem. Um, he's put in 12 gallon per hour micro sprinklers as well. So, uh, he, and then he's got these rainbirds, the LF 2400s that are a full circle. Okay. So initially, he, uh, he got to thinking about cooling in 2018. He, he was forewarned by a heat wave. So he put in these misters um, that uh, every fourth tree row, uh, putting out about 4,000 gallons per hour. And he only got one and a half degrees drop in, in temperature. And he had major fruit loss. So he knew he had to do something different. Uh, so he talked to Nick Coetzee and he, he, he used the same systems. He, he put in Rainbirds and he's installed these Hendrickson pressure regulators. Um, and so he, he's, he's got galvanized pipe. And so these are, this is an impact sprinkler and it's, there's a lot of kick to it. So the, the, um, the galvanized pipe keeps the, um, the, the, the the riser stable, and then he adds the PVC to, to go higher than the tree. 
And in this new planning, he's got these pipes that um, are, are tied to the, to the galvanized pipe that um, keeps them stable. He's got uh, reservoirs, uh, three 5,000 gallon tanks, plus he's got a 32,000 gallon tank that um, supplies water to the orchard and it's all by gravity flow. And this is his manifold where he, he controls water going to the three different blocks. And so he's got a control valve um, box, which uh, the water either goes to the irrigation system or it goes to the riser that uh, controls the, the cooling system. And so he's got a um, sprinkler spaced every 60 feet, um, every fourth row. It's got a 70 foot throw pattern and he, he's got more overlap than, than Nick has. Um, on September 6th, this is the, 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 the real test that happened to the system. Uh, on September 6th, he ran the system when it was 115 degrees. Um, he used 3,000 gallons per hour and it dropped temperatures five to seven degrees and he had no damage where water was hitting the trees or fruit drop. Um, his costs are in the range of $1,200 per acre um, or it's, it's less than that. So. Um, on a, on a small orchard, um, this can be a very effective system. So with that, I would like to open this up to a discussion group, a short panel. I know it's getting late, um, but I think we have a few questions that we can bring up. And I was hoping that um, uh, John Rowley and um, Ryan Halby and Ken King could come online and open this up to a panel discussion. Are there questions from the group, from the attendees? Okay, from John Cornell. I foresee the main problem that our industry faces regarding orchard cooling is water delivery. In the majority of groves, there's likely not enough water delivery available to both irrigate the grove while simultaneously running some sort of overhead water cooling system. Since the avocado shut down transpiration at far lower temperatures than we would need to apply overhead cooling, does it make sense that we continue to irrigate the roots when we have these events and redirect the water to overhead cooling instead? So this opens up the question of, do we need to irrigate at the same time as we're running our cooling system? Um, Ken, do you want to answer that question? Hi, Ben. Hi, uh, Ken. This is Ken King, grower in Santa Paula. My problem with that would be uh, dealing with water availability. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're just limited with how much water we have. And if everybody turns their water on at the same time, that's not going to work. So what, what I've found is that um, when I irrigated, I could drop the temperature about one and a half degrees. But with the overhead cooling system, I could drop the temperature five to seven degrees, get total coverage of my orchard with no fruit or tree, fruit loss or tree damage. <clears throat> and I was only using 75% uh, of the amount of water I would have used if I had been irrigating. So Ken, how many times did you run the system last year? Twice. Twice. So you're not really irrigating continuously the way the apple orchards are being done in, in uh, Washington. No, I made a point of making sure I irrigated uh, thoroughly at least the day before, 24 to 48 hours before the heat wave, and then uh, tried to turn my sprinklers on, uh, the overhead sprinklers on, uh, you know, one to two hours before we knew that it was going to get hot. So for us, it was uh, 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning when the temperatures reached uh, 98 to 100 degrees. Yeah, and so you've got pretty darn poor quality water, as I understand. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, John, do you want to comment on that? Is it necessary to run your irrigation system at the same time as the cooling system? Uh, the answer, I think, in avocados would definitely be a no. I mean, just a point of clarification, you have, you have in the apples a situation where they are also reacting to temperature conditions. In other words, 
maybe those temperature conditions are much lower that they need to react to than, than an avocado grower might react to. But nevertheless, uh, the, 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 the overhead systems rarely run at night, if, if never, um, uh, for cooling. That, that's when they'll switch to their drip or their under tree micro um, for irrigation. And that's, that's typically the strategy you see in apples. You, it's, it's rare you see the overhead system become the irrigation system during the year. And, and our temperatures come in waves. Uh, some days we'll have five days in a row of hot temperatures. But on those five days in a row, they're watering only to react to the heat. So again, measuring the temperature of the apple itself. And, and when that temperature in the apple gets too hot, the system goes on. And then when it cools down, then it shuts off. Yeah. Ryan, you want to comment about this? Do you run I the irrigation system at the same time as your cooling? No. No, I think it's best, and what we're planning on doing is doing as much as pre-irrigation as possible, irrigating at night, and, you know, during that critical time, say that 10, 11 o'clock in the morning for that four to seven hours is to switch to the overhead and then back to under tree irrigation. So we're, you're not really using this system to irrigate, you're using it only to cool only to cool. Okay. So um, what maybe Ken or John or Ryan could comment about what proportion of the total water use in the orchard might be used for cooling versus the need for irrigation. So if, if you're looking at your, your um, budget for water for the year, how much water do you think you'd be using for cooling versus just for irrigation? Well, Ben, for myself, it'd be a very small percentage. If I only irrigated, uh, if I use the, uh, the the overhead sprinklers for six to eight hours, um, you know, that's uh, very small. It'll probably one or two percent of my total water use. Yeah. Ryan, you have a comment? Pretty much the same answer. It's going to be utilizing it during heat wave events, or or say we have a situation where we have a stretch between you know over 100 degrees for a week then then that would be that time set so pretty much the same answer yeah john do you have a comment about proportion of water use for cooling versus the need for irrigation well everything i've been told about what you're dealing with in avocados is really along the same lines as what's already been suggested you're going to mm -hmm. react to those days that are somewhere north of 100 degrees and and every other day you're not going to react to it because you just don't have the resource to do it yeah so one of the questions that came up have growers you, you had a picture of a wind machine and a cooling uh, irrigation have growers tried using high volume water jets along with the, a um, wind machine no, I, well, the answer is yes. It, <laughs> everything gets tried. <laughs> is, it, is it used at all? The answer is no. The, the pictures of the wind machines are for frost mitigation that you see out there. Frost control is widely practiced in the Northwest. And so those are used during cold periods of time. So what, here's some really good questions. What are the on-off cycle times used in Ken and Nick's um, orchards. Uh, I, I know Nick uses a 30 minute on and then he cycles that five times. So it's, it's not coming back for another hour and a half. Um, Ken, what's your cycle time? Uh, mine was on hundred uh, percent. The thought of cycling never crossed my mind. And I really like what John Rowley said about trying 50%. So I, I, I would look into that because again, water is, uh, water availability as a concern and how long it will last for. But uh, if there's a way to turn it on for five minutes, turn it off for five minutes or on for 10, off for 10, that sounds good to me. That's a 50% reduction in water use. And so that needs Nick, some automation then. Yes, and Nick is doing that. I think he was uh, doing, th was it 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off, something like that. And he was getting good results with that. So yeah. if I could cut yeah. my water usage from, 38, uh, you know, 30, 3,500 gallons an hour down to 2,000. I'd be pleased with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so that's all the questions. Oh, what about anti-siphon issues? Is there an issue with backflow that you need to have backflow preventers to, you know, you've got this water at, you know, 15 feet high. Do you have any issues with, you know, uh, con water contamination? Uh, not, not yet. Uh, I do have a backflow <laughs> preventer for, for my, at our, our property. Uh, the one thing I do, don't have is check valves. Again, uh, John Rowley's uh, um, suggestion of using check valves sound good because I know when I turn my system off, the bottom sprinkler is drained for about 30 minutes. So, which is, which is interesting. So All question, the, oh, go ahead. Really common to see slam check valves. I don't know if you're, you know, up in the Northwest, we're dealing with a lot of large pipes and, and very large systems, 12 to 24 inch pipes on a lot of these systems. And nearly all of them have what are called slam checks on them at the pump station. So the water does not flow back into the ponds, holds it into the, holds it in the main lines. So Ken, maybe you can answer this uh, question comes in. Can you store enough water in your tanks to, to meet the needs of cooling rather than irrigation? Can you store enough water for cooling? It, it's hard to say. I, I think uh, 3,000 gallons an hour, my tank's going to last uh, maybe four hours, four to five hours. Yeah. And the shortest event that I've participated in so far was six hours. So, and that's where uh, the cycling on and off would extend that to possibly 10 or 12 hours. That'd be great. That, that would be a real good idea. With the Edison's uh, public safety power shutoffs, uh, that's a concern for us. Uh, however, the, the heat waves have never uh, that we've had so far have not taken place during uh, east wind events. Um, but I'm, I am definitely looking for, to, uh, for ways to increase my storage capacity on my property. Yeah. So here's a question. Um, at what temperature do you kick the cooling system on? Ryan? Mm, good question. I would probably say north of 100. Maybe, maybe a hundred five. Definitely have it on. Ken, yeah, I, I thought so. Uh, the same thing around one hundred three to one hundred four. But the the big event in twenty eighteen, July sixth of twenty eighteen, we had a hundred degrees at eight in the morning, and by ten o'clock it was a hundred and ten. Uh, and uh, then that's when we got up to one hundred eighteen around eleven or twelve. And we had no wind at all, no prevailing winds. It was dead calm probably till about 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, so I would, uh, in retrospect, looking back, I think I, I would start turning on, if, if we thought it was going to be a hot hot day, something over 104, 105 degrees, I'd get that water on probably around 98 degrees. And yeah. uh, maybe I'd run it for an hour longer than I needed to. But um, we did one little test when the temperatures reached 100 degrees. And what we found was that uh, we turned the sprinklers on at 100 degrees at, uh, I believe it was two, 1 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It took 45 minutes for the temperature to drop down to, um, it was 92, uh, 93 degrees right in there. We had a, a 5 to 8 degree drop in temperature at that time. And uh, so, it, so I was surprised it took that long to get the temperatures down. And then an hour later, we turned the temperature, we turned the water off and the temperatures immediately came back up to uh, about 98 degrees. So uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a lag in there from uh, when you turned it on to where you might, might see results. And, and I know Nick was turning it on at about 95 to 100 degrees. Um, underscoring what Julia said, it's the temperature of the leaf, not the air that's important. So having a leaf temperature sensor is a really good idea. Like Ryan's got his, uh, his uh, moisture sensor on the leaf. So with that, we're gonna close this out. And this again is being recorded. Um, it will be available probably next week after Peter finishes messing with it. Um, uh, at the California Avocado Society website, um, look it up, it'll be there. Um, so thank you very much.
Ken and Ryan and John and Nick Coetzee. Thank you so much.